Not just party your life. I was listening to that this morning. Jesus is just not part of your life. He is your life. That's the difference. I've said it before. Salvation in a nutshell is being in love with Jesus Christ more than anything else in this world. And I do fear. And many people who profess salvation who are truly, truly in Christ. Serious stuff, folks. We need to make sure. We need to make, as Peter reminds us, make our calling, plan, election, for sure, examine ourselves whether we're in the faith or not. And of course, we know we can be in the faith. As the Spirit of this is our Spirit. As we desire the things of God, I want to go with Him. First Peter, chapter 4. Today, as we look at this passage, chapter 4, there will be a message of encouragement, but there will be also a message of challenge. Because we've been changed from glory to glory. God is perfect. God does not change because He's absolute perfection. We need to be changed. We are being changed from glory to glory. First Peter 4 verse 7 as we continue our studies in this great epistle. And of course Peter was encouraging these persecuted, suffering believers to inspire them uh, to keep pressing on as glory is a place reserved on the five in heaven for them. First Peter 4 verse 7 but the end of all things is at hand. In other words, the return of Christ. Be therefore sober. These are commandments of Peter, exhortations. To these suffering believers who were going through persecution and hardship, but it's also to us. And watch unto prayer. And above all things, have fervent. Charity, love among yourselves. For charity shall cover the multitude of sins. That is some challenge. You're probably wondering what is he meaning. But well, I experiment through to explain it. Use hospitality one to another without grudging. As every man has received the gift. If you're saved today, you've received the gift. Of eternal life. I remember Sunday Rogers Ben was with us this morning. On Sunday was the principal of the first year at Bible College of Faith Mission. And I remember him saying that every true believer has received at least one gift because you the gift of eternal life. If any man have received the gift, even so minister the same one to another. And of course, God the Spirit gives us different gifts for the edification of the saints. As good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Verse 11, if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister or serve, let him do it as of the ability which God giveth, that all that God and all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. And amen. We just finish at first. 11 and the Lord will bless his precious word which is set in heaven to us today. In the early church, Christians had an expectancy. William Carey reminds us of camp, great things for God and expect great things from God. And Christians had an expectancy that the Lord Jesus Christ would return. In their very lifetime, even the Apostle Paul had an expectancy that he would return in his generation. Even though Christ has not returned yet, nevertheless, that does not invalidate his promise, and that every generation of believers must still live in expectancy because the Lord could return for his bride at any time. It will be imminent. The church does not look for signs, dear friends. The Jews look for signs. Christ will come and rapture his bride at any time. 
This is why Peter says, But the end of all things is at hand, verse 7 a. As a result, the Christians were expecting the Lord to return in their generation. Now we're around 2,000 years later. <coughs> and I trust that you expect, or as your legs or your feet so much dug into the world, cemented to the world, instead of fact, setting our affections more on the things above, of course we have to live, we have to work, we have to provide for one another and families, that's, that's practical, that's good, that's commendable. But dear friends, the Lord wants us to walk lightly on this earth and have our affections more for glory. For me to live as Christ and to die as Him. Set your affections in the things above, Paul says. And as a result, we should not expect and watch that the Lord could come at any time and rapture his bride up into the sky. And it's going to be imminent. It's not going to be any signs, dear friends. Signs is to do with the second coming. But with plenty of signs in, when God sends his plagues upon this earth, it'll be unimaginable. And as a result, we should be about the Master's business, investing in his kingdom more than our own kingdoms. We have to live. God knows that all good things come from above. Not in wrong own and some as long as it doesn't own you. But dear friends, I've said it more times and I'll say it again. Don't be duped or deceive the devil to deceive you. By investing your own empires more than God's empire. Because we will all give an account before God. The judgment seat of Christ will it be one hand stubble, shame faced, empty handed, bankrupt, or will it be well done, thy faithful and good servant? You see, we're meant to be about the master's business, and how we live and serve the Lord today will determine on how we are judged on all and rewarded on that day. The rewards in this world, folks, is only temporary. The pleasures in this world is only very brief. But the rewards and glory is for eternity. Get your priorities right. Get up strongly. Get your priorities right. You can see them a wee bit far up with it. You see, folks, we are to have the attitude of expectancy. And not become slothful, lazy in the things of God. People have it in reverse order. The church, and as a whole, generally speaking, they have it in reverse order in this province. Dear friends, spiritual things are far more prominent and important than physical, temporal things. Your temporal things will no good in the day of judgment for eternity. You will be losing heart and rewards for glory. And God has given us this lovely building. It's only a building at the end of the day, the church is a people. But God has given us this place, a platform to serve Him. You see, folks, we're not to be slothful, lazy dreamers, or obsessed with wide speculations even regarding prophecy. Of course, the return of Christ for his bride gives us great hope and inspiration and encouragement. As Peter was encouraging his readers, after all, many were suffering hardships, trials, persecutions under this evil Roman emperor Nero. They were scattered abroad, it says at the very beginning of this letter. And Peter listed a number of commandments to his readers to keep them balanced as far as the Lord's return was concerned. He gives them a number of commandments here in these number of verses, as passages I've read today. These are commandments. These are not to be taken lightly. These are not just to be taken or taken or leave it on the truth. 
The commandments of God is always pure and right. They're not grievous. They should be a delight to the people of God. And Peter gives a list here. First of all, in verse 7, he says, be sober. Secondly, in verse 7, he says, watch on the prayer. This is the light of the Lord's return. Dear friends, Christ will come at any time for his bride. It's going to be imminent. Verse 8, he says, have fervent love. Verse 9, another commandment is exercise hospitality. Verse 10 and 11 is minister your spiritual gifts. Peter was exhorting his readers to continue in love for one another in the midst of suffering because the Lord's return is getting closer, verse 7 and 8, but the end of all things is at hand. Every second is getting closer, folks, to the Lord's return. There's no more second chances. What do you do if you're saved today for Christ will determine your rewards and glory? For eternity. We are to live expectantly in relation to the Lord's return and to be prepared. We are continually to grow in love for God and others, especially the household of faith. First of all, Peter instructs his readers be sober, verse 7, which means to be sober minded. Many people's minds are clouded, confused, chaos, that's what the devil does. The devil wants to confuse you. He wants your mind to be wrapped up with so many other things. Chaos, trouble, chasing your own tail. Peter says be sober minded. Keep your mind steady. Keep your mind disciplined. Keep your mind clear, be balanced. Keep cool and not allow you to get influenced by wide speculations in relation to prophecy. You see, but the end of all things is at hand. Be you therefore sober. The opposite of being sober minded is frenzy and madness, ludicrous. We are not to get caught up with people who express their fanciful speculations by selling dates regarding Christ's return or claim to know who the Antichrist is, etc., etc., by flooding our minds with these wild speculations from these super so called spiritual people. Ten times the Apostle Paul in the epistles warns us to be sober minded. To be sober minded is to be clear in our thinking, to have a disciplined mind, have clarity, be intellectually sound, be solid and not false to and fro, with every wind, new wind of doctrine, being unstable and going off on a tangent, embracing some new interpretation of scripture, especially regarding prophecy. The sober minded saint will be consistent, not be drifting. And will have discernment, sound judgment regarding doctrinal matters and practical affairs of life. The sober minded saint will exercise restraint and not be impulsive or vulnerable. Yes, folks, we are to study prophecy, which should give us a longing and an expect expectancy and an excitement in our hearts for the Lord's return, but we are not to abuse prophecy and go off in a tangent. If we are sober-minded, we will be alert, we will be self-controlled, we will be disciplined, we will have our priorities right, and of course, desire the place of prayer, verse 7b, but the end of all things is to come. Be you therefore sober, and watch unto prayer. The sober mind of saint will be alert and controlled in his prey or her prey, on the pulse, be discerning, having wisdom. His or her prey will, will be fervent, not lazy in the place of prayer, agonizing, their whole being will be engaged in it. They will not be just saying 
the same routine birth, friend from the head instead of friend from the heart. But on the pulse, they'll be on the pulse, they'll be up to date. They'll be praying the Spirit, alert, inspired by the Holy Spirit. And of course, Jesus says himself, watch and pray. That you enter not in the temptation. Watch and pray. That you enter not in the temptation. Peter tells us here. The end is at hand. Christ will come at any time. Be therefore sober. Be in the right. Have your priorities right. And watch on the prayer. Jesus says, watch and pray that you enter not in the temptation. And why is it, dear friends, and this is why I'm burdened. Why is it, dear friends, in our generation, two people turn up on a Tuesday night, four people turn up on Thursday night? Thank God for the ones who are consistent. When I was going to raise Jesus' commandment, what's in prayer? What is it? Well, we're the generation, Lord. We don't need to pray. We don't need to depend on thee. We are self-sufficient. We have got everything. And folks, I'm not saying this again. Right? I'm just saying it as out of love for your own spiritual walk with God, which is more important than anything else. Thank God, normally it's God more turns up than that, by the way. And it's not about the amount of who turns up either. But it's showing the spiritual temperature. Of this nation. We know it's more because we're a smaller congregation, but it is throughout our own folks and the majority of fellowships. Why is the place of prayer neglected? That is the most important prayer. Meeting in the hot church. If you don't pray, folks, this church is closed down, believe me. Christ the Calvin stick of home. No matter about me or anybody else. Christ doesn't need me or you, Christ goes on. What did they do to the churches in Revelation? The candlestick was worn out. A man they are being deceived. This is the most urgent need if there's ever a need for our nation today. Is prayer. I can't have hammered enough. One generation of folks are wondering why. Oh, the nation is a terrible place. Yes, it is. Our generation has been absolutely destroyed. And where's the burn? Where's the apathy? It's serious. Just take it and leave it on the tree. And the Lord might as well just wipe that out in that verse. Watch and pray that you have been up in temptation. Might as well wipe that verse out of Peter as well. Watch on the prayer. Prayer, folks, is the greatest tool that God gives us the church, as well as the Lord. Prayer is for your benefit. Prayer is for my benefit. Prayer it calls us, realize the Lord. We are desperate when you pray with a true servant heart. You are praying and humbling yourself before God. Lord, I am dependent on thee. I am useless in my own strength. I am bankrupt. I need thee. And the church as a whole are trying this and they're trying that. Dear friends, they need to try what God tells us to do. Pray. Preach. Comply, my word, obedience, holiness, faith. Sadly, Peter fell. Why did Peter fail? Because he did not heed this warning. But Jesus said in the Garden of Gethsemane, Watch and pray that the anger of the temptation, the spirit and day is one, but the flesh is weak. And I'm preaching, folks, today to encourage you to get into the place of prayer for your own spiritual. Walk with God. It's for your own mouth. How many are falling in the sin, temptation, 
that falls because of place of prayer has been neglected. And they are not spiritually alert or spiritually discerning as their mind is clouded with so many other things. As God's people, we are to be sober minded, disciplined, alert, which will inspire us to study, meditate upon God's word and be in the place of prayer daily. Someone said, read the Bible carefully, meditate. Meditation keeps out Satan, it increases knowledge, it inflames love, it works patience, it promotes prayer. Nehemiah, one example, Nehemiah, who's overwhelmingly against all odds, Hamdala, Sambal and Tobai, and Tobai, Sambal and Tobai, and others were against them, against the building of the walls of Jerusalem. Nehemiah was alert spiritually and physically. As he built the walls in Jerusalem, as he said, rise up and build. He had an alert attitude and was on guard as he prayed and worked against the odds by rising up and building. When our thinking and praying is right, then our living will be right and we will have the proper attitude as our affections primary or on the things above with the expectation of the Lord's return for his bride. Peter also exhorts his readers here to have fervent love for one another, leading up to the Lord's return in verse 8. And above all things, have fervent love, charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. One of the reasons why the believers likely thought the Lord was returning in their generation in the early church was because they were suffering terribly. They were being persecuted extremely, which was one of the signs of his return. So in reality, especially in times of great testings and persecution, believers need to help and support and encourage one another because, dear friends, we are in very small days. Small things regarding people being truly saved. And as a result, we need to come together and encourage one another by loving one another by being united in heart. Fervent love is the supreme virtue in the Christian life. It says above all in verse 8, what is the fruit of the Spirit? The first one is love and the rest, the other eight hang on it. We are to love one another with intensity, with eagerness. And if you love someone, you'll tell them the truth. You'll not be a deceiver. Such love is not sentimental but sacrificial and requires spiritual muscles being stretched even if it requires injury, insult, persecution for the sake of the brethren. This love has to be worked off just the way an athlete works on his skills as it mainly involves a dedicated will rather than matter of emotions. Christian love is sacrificial. Christian love is long-suffering. Christian love is forgiven. It does not hold grudges and means we try to treat others the way God treats us. Christian love does not embrace condoned sin because if you love somebody you will be grieved, burned to see your loved one or friend practice sin by destroying themselves. Outward manifestations, think of the drug addict, if, it, if it's your son or your daughter or whoever, then it'll, it'll hurt you. Or if it's a loved one or friend, if it's not the alcoholic, if it's a gambler, if it's a moral person. You see, Christian love doesn't condone sin. Rather, true Christian love will try and help the sinner by not spreading their sins they are committing in gossip or backbiting, by, but rather concealing between both parties. Verse 8 be, I'll just read verse 8 all, and above all things have fervent love, surely among yourselves, for surely shall cover the multitude of sins. Love shall cover the multitude of sins. Christian love does not spread sins, their sins, about another person. They can see them. They can be trusted. When there is hatred instead of love, malice will manifest itself to tear down a person's character through gossip 
slander and backbiting. Solomon reminds us hatred stir up stress, but love cover all sins. Believers are not to gossip about other people's sins, especially those who are in Christ, that will give the world even more ammunition to slander and persecute us. Yes, we are to confess our sins to God, no one, because no one can hide their sins from the Lord at a personal level. When Noah got drunk and was naked, two of his sons, Shem and Japheth, did their best to cover their father's shame, having a loving concern for Noah. Yet his other son, Ham, had a different attitude. He was disrespectful and spread it around. Lot of his father's sins. How people respond to the sin and embarrassment of others is an indication of their character. Believers are meant to be people of integrity, trustworthy, not tailors, not slumbers, spreading gossip, backbiting about others. You see, Peter tells us love covers a multitude of sins. When the woman was caught in adultery and brought to Jesus, the Lord responded, He that is without sin and only God can first cast a stone on her and go and sin no more. How easy people can ridicule and slander others. What about the big plank in their eyes? True believers are meant to be trustworthy. True believers are meant to be people of integrity. True believers are meant to be people of good character. True believers are not meant to be tailbearers, backbiters, slumbers, spreading gossip about others. They're meant to cover a multitude of sins, especially if it's another brother or sister. Not to fame their character. Not to put the boot in order when they're down. We're meant to encourage and try and pick them up again. How would we like people promote and spread the sins about us? So in return, we should not practice this by destroying people's reputations through gossip, slander, backbiting, verse 8. Above all things, have firm and charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Peter also exhorts us here very quickly to exercise hospitality in relation to the return of Christ. Verse 9, use hospitality one to another without grudging. Hospitality is a great virtue in which Jesus commanded believers who provide food, clothing and shelter to others, Matthew 25. I thank God even for those years in the mission, 10 years, meeting so many different people um, who gave hospitality to myself. And even the carry and Matthew at the time, staying overnight in, in, in missions in different places in England and so forth in Scotland. In the early church, hospitality was practiced especially for those who were itinerant preachers going from place to place to share the gospel. Hospitality shows kindness but is also profitable for fellowship one with another to encourage to build each other up in Christ. Abraham was hospitable to three strangers and soon discovered that he had entertained the Lord and two angels. We should not open our homes to others expecting that they will return the favour. No, it is to encourage one another and that the Lord will be glorified. Hospitality was a vital important ministry in the early church because there was very few inns and guest houses for itinerant evangelists to stay, plus many could not afford to stay there anyway. And also persecuted saints, which was prominent, needed places to stay where they could be assisted and encouraged. So hospitality was very important in the early church. It's important as well today. It's shown kindness. It's commended by Christ. It's also helping fellowship, encouraging a brother and sister in Christ. 
When the Apostle Paul was engaged in his missionary journeys, he would have received hospitality from other believers. At the very beginning of this matter, Peter informs us that these believers were scattered, being persecuted, who certainly would have appreciated hospitality. So leading up to the second coming of Christ, especially during the Great Tribulation period, when many tribulation believers will suffer at the hands of the Antichrist, they will certainly greatly appreciate hospitality. Finally, dear friends, on a positive note, Christian love must result in service by exercising your spiritual gifts in verse 10 and 11. As every man had received the gift, even so minister to the same one to another, as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If any man speak, let him speak as the organs of God. If any man minister, let him do it as of the ability which God giveth, that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Every Christian has received a spiritual, a special gift. We have the gift of eternal life. Every true believer has a divine enablement for ministry in the church with different abilities. We all know that. God gives us different abilities, different gifts. Paul gave an analogy in 1 Corinthians 12 just as each part of the human body has a particular function, so does each member of the body of Christ. He says here, But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit. God has given us different gifts to be exercised for the application of the saints and for his glory. The challenge is, I wonder, are you exercising them to their full capacity? Or are you utilizing them by crunching and breathing the spirit? There is speaking gifts and serving gifts, and both are important to the church. Not everyone is a public speaker or teacher our preacher, but nevertheless we all should be able to witness, share the gospel and the word of God to individuals, as Peter reminds us in the last chapter, be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks if you a reason for the hope that is in you. When was the last time you shared Christ with someone? There are certain gifts, practical gifts, behind the scenes ministries, that help to make the public ministries possible. I thank God for the ones in this church who are serving the Lord in a practical manner. Continue on. The Lord will bless you for that. He'll be rewarded and glory for that. Just as the eye needs the ear to function properly in the human body, so the church needs others. Other others who exercise their spiritual gifts to function properly, if they don't, it becomes dysfunctional. And folks, that's why I was so burdened there a few minutes ago with prayer. If we don't pray, this church will become dysfunctional. And the candlestick will be burnt out. Christ will move on. Verse 10 and 11. As every man received the gift, even so minister serve the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. We are to serve one another. The pastor just has to serve just everybody. It's just the pastor giving out. No, dear friends, we all have to serve one another. And I'm going to be straight. I don't care. I'm burned and honestly. And I know some people can't make it on a Thursday night because of practical reasons. But dear friends, when a minister spends hours and hours preparing a sermon for a Thursday night, and people can't turn up when they, when they should be there, you know what it's like? It's like inviting somebody to your house and saying, I've made a meal for you, and then saying, I have there and they don't turn up. And the spiritual food is far more important than the physical food. It 
in these days of small things. Spiritually speaking, in our land, how we need to work together as a body of Christ, as a local assembly. I know some of us become battle weary, we all can. But don't fall into and be conditioned. This is just the way it is. Don't fall into the trap of the devil. This is the way it is. And become battle weary. And that apathy kick in. And then what happens? You become really warm. And then what happens? You don't become concerned. Dear friends, the are days of small things. God has chosen our land. There's no doubt about it. And rightly so. It was a totally rebel against his gospel and against his Christ. We will not have this man. There's parade your bright parades through Belfast and down the road, all in mar morality and everything. And that's only in morality, what about everything else going along with it? We are in days of small things, firstly speaking. But the Lord can use, and normally in the Bible it tells us he only uses a small remnant to turn things right around. Don't fall into the trap of the devil's lies and be conditioned by him. Oh, this is just the way it is and fall into the thing. And become battle weary. There's no doubt about it. Second Thessalonians tells us that there will be a great, great fall away and then the wicked one will be revealed, the Antichrist. We are this generation, there is a massive falling away in, in the West. There is a great apostasy. In which I believe the Lord could come at any time to receive his bride in the earth. I wonder today, are you prepared? As the day of the Lord draws nigh. No more second chances, folks, when the Lord comes. Are you saved? Are you truly saved? Have you a desire for the things of above? Have you a desire for righteousness? Have you a desire to glorify the Lord? If you love someone, you want to be in their presence. Christ has to be forced. God doesn't get the straps here, friends. That's a delusion from the devil. God has to be forced in your life. If any man come up to me, that in the name says, and take up the cross and follow me daily. I, it's not I just have God in my life, it's God has to be your life. Paul says, preserve your body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. It's not this old oh, great. Sacrifice you've done for God? No. This is your reasonable service. This is the least you can do. Are you prepared? As the day of the Lord draw up now. Are you saved? Have you counted the cost? Are you finished with your sin? Have you repented? Have you received Christ? Folks, it's Christ's heaven and glory. Paradise or is your sin? Hell, judgment, wrath. Peter instructs us to be sober. Get our priorities right in other words. Keep our minds clear. Keep our minds disciplined. Keep looking to the one who is the author and finisher of our faith. Peter instructs us to be watchful in prayer. I trust this has challenged my heart and your heart today. Peter has instructed us to be fervent in love. In other words, come alongside and encourage your brother. Don't condemn them. Don't spread the sins maybe that fall in the around and gossip about them. Peter's report instructs us also to exercise hospitality and minister your spiritual gifts by encouraging, strengthening one another, leading up to the return of Christ. Are you exercising your gifts today? Are you breaking the spirit? 
Folks, this has been quite hard hitting today. And I get no pleasure when I preach it in love. Because I am accountable to God regarding how I am faithful and regarding looking to see you grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. The Lord bless these words to us today and help us and strengthen us in these days as we keep pressing on for His glory. Amen. It's 1241.